Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on this 51st Earth Day. I have the good fortune of collaborating with a dynamic California Board of Trustees in support of the incredible team at the Nature Conservancy. I know I speak for our board when I say we are knocked out by the cutting edge science, ideas, and execution in continuing to work to preserve our natural world across land, oceans, water, and cities. The Nature Conservancy is driving innovation and science at a scale that can meet the enormity of the challenges we face today. At the Nature Conservancy, we're inspired by a poetically simple and powerful promise. Nature is our solution. Because our science shows that when we protect nature, nature protects us. By doing everything we can to help nature thrive, nature can solve humanity's biggest problems. But we need to go bigger, we need to go faster. Our science also shows that time is running out. That's why our theme today is the determining decade. Most of you inherently understand what that refers to. The decade ahead of us will be uniquely fateful. Never before have the foundations of life itself been in such a peril at the hands of humanity itself. Our future is still a choice, but we no longer have time for business as usual. We need the full-throated support of partners who are closest to the problems we are solving, of governments, corporations, and most importantly, you. Those who understand the existential threat we're facing and who are ready to make the critical decisions to change our trajectory. I'm sure we all get dismayed over this state of affairs, and I know I do, sometimes in the most unexpected places, like on vacation, swimming in the ocean and noticing signs of stress that weren't there the year before, or conversing with friends, educated, caring people who still doubt the current reality of our natural world. But then again, we know that the darkest hours in human history can be met with equal parts fortitude and inspiration. I witnessed such an act recently in my own home. During the early days of the pandemic, my 22-year-old son was moved by images of farmers burying millions of pounds of food in the ground while lines at food banks extended for miles. He and a friend reached out to farmers to donate food, which they personally transported. They designed a plan to scale the effort, recruited more college friends to help, and along the way saw the best of human nature on display. The effort became an organization, some 200 students, volunteers in 36 states, working to solve the ongoing challenge of agricultural waste, which today has more, moved more than 30 million pounds of food in the last year. And a few weeks ago, my son and his partner were awarded a National Medal of Honor for their service. Yes, I'm a proud father, but I share this story to underscore for, that everyone, for everyone who doesn't care, there are those who care double and have the perseverance to help make the changes the world needs. And the Nature Conservancy is chock full of those people. And thankfully, we have all of you joining us here today. Today, we have a series of thought-provoking conversations with outstanding individuals who have a unique perspective on a range of topics, including the politics of conservation, how corporations can rise to meet this moment, and how we can better communicate the urgency of climate change. We'll end the day with a dialogue between TNC Global CEO Jennifer Morris and conservation icon Jane Goodall. If you have any comments or questions during the day, you can put them in the chat. We'll gather those and respond as best we can after the summit. To get things rolling, a conversation between global explorer and ocean advocate Alexandra Cousteau and the executive director of the Nature Conservancy in California and Hawaii, and Managing Director of Global Fisheries, Mike Sweeney. Thank you. Take it away, Mike. Hi everyone, as Kevin said, I'm Mike Sweeney, the Executive Director of the Nature Conservancy here in California. Uh, and I'm delighted that you've all uh, joined us. Uh, I've got a great program today. And I'm really uh, very fortunate to be able to spend some time this morning with my very special guest, Alexandra Cousteau. Thank you so much Hi, for- Hi Mike. 
of Zantra. Um, so Alexandra, for those of you who may not know her, uh, is a, uh, an ocean advocate, an explorer, a storyteller, uh, and a continuing the grand tradition of her grandfather in bringing the wonders of the ocean and the need to save it to our living rooms and uh, top of our minds. So I'm really thankful that we could spend some time talking about this critical decade that we're in, um, uh, and especially the oceans. So one of the things I typically don't like about Earth Day is how negative it can be. So rather than talking about how bad things are, uh, which we all know, I'd rather talk about how good things could be. Uh, and one of the things I notice um, as I enjoy the natural world is, um, is I, see, I see ghosts. I'm like that little boy in the sixth sense. Uh, and what I mean by that is I, I know too much about what we've lost. And so I think about even in the most protected areas of the world, in some of the amazing places the Nature Conservancy has been able to protect, that there's things missing. Mm -hmm. That we're we're conserving things, yes, and we're doing great work, but the world could be so much more abundant. And indeed, if we want the earth to be more resilient, we need more life. We need more uh, abundance. So I'd really like to talk uh, with you about that. And uh, one of the things you've done uh, is you've put a stake in the ground. I, I don't know what the <laughs> marine equivalent of a stake in the ground is. Um, about the year 2050 and about how we can bring our oceans back to, uh, to abundance and exuberance and resilience by 2050. Um, you've laid out uh, five critical blue issues uh, that you champion. And I'd love to just have you give our viewers something to dream about and tell them more about your uh, five critical issues uh, that, and yes. give them a sense of what a restored ocean can look like. Well, um, I, I think that having that vision of what can be and where we want to go is so important. You know, I, I think that was one of the really powerful things that my grandfather did back in the 1960s was not only show people what's there, which so many people had never seen. I mean, imagine, Mike, that back in the 1950s, people didn't know it was under the surface of the ocean. For all they knew, there could be sea dragons and monsters. They just didn't know. And so his first job was really to, to show people what was there and pull back the curtain on the oceans. But then it became clear that there was a, an ethic, a conservation ethic that was needed for the oceans because being on the front line out there, he was seeing the losses that were accruing in the oceans year after year. And so he started to, and, and my father really was part of that as well, to articulate this conservation ethic. And that was a vision. Right? That was a vision of, of what we could do. And I think that for that generation, it worked really well. We were able to start organizations like the Nature Conservancy and you know, pass legislation and do all these really important things. And yet, year after year after year, we continue to accrue losses in the oceans. And I see those same ghosts that you mentioned in the tide pools that I grew up in, in the coral reefs that I grew up in, in little bays and inlets of the Mediterranean. I see those same ghosts. And when my daughter was born about 10 years ago, I realized that we needed a new vision and that the way we articulate our ambitions in the ocean space and, and in, in the environmental space in general is really insufficient once we've reached this milestone, which is that we've lost half of our ocean, half of the whales and fish that lived in the ocean when my grandfather first started his exploration have disappeared, right? And so at this crucial moment, I think we need new words to articulate that ambition. And for me, especially after my daughter was born, I wanted to be able to tell her that she wouldn't be the generation of my family to write the obituary for the ocean. And that by 2050, which is when we were all reading there would be more plastic than fish in the ocean um, by 2050, when she's my age, that the, the ocean can be abundant once again. And so to be honest, this was a, a period of time when I felt um, a lot of sadness and, and kind of despair because I realized that the, the work that we're doing in conservation and sustainability wasn't moving the needle. It wasn't stopping this downward spiral. 
And so what would, because continuing to do this work, if it's not changing the outcome feels, feels really, I don't know, pick a word. It, it, it feels bad. Mm -hmm. So I, I realized that the words that we should be using instead are rebuilding, restoring, regeneration in service of an, a more abundant future. And, and I, I knew emotionally that this was what was right and felt good to me, but I didn't know if it was possible. And so I called my friend, uh, Professor Carlos Duarte, who I've known for a long time and asked him, do you think that this is possible? Like, could we scientifically imagine rebuilding ocean abundance to what my grandfather once knew before 2050? And he said, not only is it possible, but I'm writing a, an article about it with Boris Worm and all these other amazing marine biologists. And uh, we expect it will be published in, in Nature magazine. And so for me, that was a turning point when I wanted to really understand what this vision of the future could and should be and build uh, an organization that could be small and, and nimble, but that could catalyze that restoration. It takes the science to action. And those catalysts that, that we've um, determined are, are kind of key elements to being able to leapfrog into that more abundant future are ocean forests. Um, and, and people don't really realize that we have all of these ocean forests in the ocean, but it, they're beautiful and, and they're extraordinary and, and they haven't gotten enough attention. And so, so we're really looking at how we can um, catalyze and scale the restoration of those forests. And then the other side of that coin is regenerative ocean farming. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, coral reefs that we could lose within the next decade for all intents and purposes. So we're looking at how we can accelerate restoration through new technologies to be able to do that. Um, and of course, the future of seafood is, is really important. How, and this is something I know you know so much about, Mike, but you know, how how we manage our oceans um, and feed the world moving forward is going to be critically important. And finally, blue carbon. This is really an exciting area. It's something that's been getting a lot more attention. Um, but I think that if we start looking at our oceans as the incredibly productive and resilient ecosystems that they are and put in place the measures to get on a regenerative pathway to the future that we can be successful. And, and that's what drives me. We have this determining decade ahead of us. And, and if we do the things that we need to do during those 10 years, we can chart a course to a totally different future in a future where our children will know the lost abundance um, that we no longer do. That's beautiful. So, so one of the things that I wanted to just pick up on there is just, you know, the the notion that there's these underwater forests and underwater grasslands mm -hmm. or the kelp forests and seagrass beds and um, that how, how unaware people are that we have these underground, mm -hmm. underwater forests and, and grasslands, for, for lack of better terms, it's, and they are truly incredible. I suppose if the water was warmer, more, more divers would get in there, but I uh, get to see it. Um, I've had some of the most harrowing dives in my life diving in a kelp forest uh, at the wrong time of year. But um, oh yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, on that on, on that note, I mean, California is witness to one of the incredible uh, phenomena happening around the world, which is that our kelp forests are collapsing. We've lost 95% of the kelp forests on the north coast of California, gone. Um, and uh, and so yeah, we've got to put those back, and we've got to um, we've got to regenerate those and bring them back to life because they provide so much to people, right? They they buffer waves and and, and they they're nurseries for fish, and not not to mention magnificent places to be. But one of the things that I'm interested in when you talk about regenerative uh, regeneration of the oceans and uh, the farming of the oceans is how perhaps the actual um, farming of seaweeds and kelps could actually help us bring back those lost ecosystems. And I know it's very utilitarian, right? It's like we're going to farm them for our own uses. But in doing so, could we actually restore lost ecosystem function? You know what I'm getting at? I yeah, absolutely. And I, I think what is 
really, as I've learned more about ocean farming and, and especially um, the, the farming of kelp, is that the, well, let, let me just share a little bit about how it's done because I, I think a lot of people imagine that the same intensive farming in the ocean that we've done on land. And it's important to note that obviously that's not the intention, that's not the roadmap. Um, and that's that's not, you know, the seaweed farming is an agricultural activity that humans can practice that is restorative to the oceans. And if we choose to, to do it that way, rather than pumping in fertilizers and doing all these other ridiculous things that, that I haven't heard anyone suggest that we do, um, then, you know, but but the the way that, that kelp is farmed is that in nature, it has roots that, that kind of, you know, latch on to stones. We can't plant them that way in the ocean. So what's done is that they they har they harvest the parts of the kelp that are like these little reproductive pockets on on the plant, and in there are the spores. And so the spores come out of the pocket in a tank, and they latch onto string, just white string, and they they um, that's what they put out on between buoys. So it's really simple. There's hardly any footprint and the, the kelp grows from those ropes. But what's interesting is that the ocean doesn't really care whether a kelp grows from a rock or if it grows from a rope. The, the plants have the same impact, right? They're de-acidifying the water. They're re-oxygenating the water. They're mm -hmm. creating buffers against um, waves. They're creating essential habitat for all kinds of marine life and and they're regenerative in that way and what's interesting about seaweed because you know the the blue carbon benefits um, of you know salt marshes and seagrass and mangroves are important um, but their footprint in the world is fixed you can't expand their footprint outside of where they naturally grow but with kelp you can because it's growing on ropes between buoys. And mm. so you, it's, it's the one type of regenerative ocean farming where you can scale it and, and magnify the, the positive impacts for the ocean. Um, you know, what, what we've seen with wild forests in California has also happened in other places that used to have almost 100% um, ocean forests along their coast, like Portugal, um, you know, in, in uh, Tasmania, they've seen huge losses to their natural forests. And so while we try to regenerate those forests and bring them back and address all the challenges inherent in that activity, we can scale ocean farming and in the process, create livelihoods and oftentimes alternative livelihoods for fishermen um, or new sources of livelihood for women that allow them to care for their families and care for their children. And, um, and that's tremendously exciting because it, then it becomes a foundational element to a regenerative blue economy and a really important part of the just transition. Thanks for that. And so and another part of, of your plan you, you talked about is, is of course, um, is dealing with our overfishing problem and um, moving fishing practices to more sustainable um, uh, activities, which is something I and my colleagues at TNC work on a lot. But what do you think about fish farming? Um, there's a lot of controversy around that. And uh, it's probably the, it's growing a lot faster than wild harvest. Uh, fisheries. And so we're seeing kind of a, a wild, wild west out there in terms of development of, of fish farming. And we know that, you know, some of that can be done pretty badly and actually degrade the ocean versus restore it. What have you seen out there? on that? That's a really great question, Mike. And I think that um, we've seen both with wild fisheries and with aquaculture, the worst of the worst of what we could possibly do in the oceans. And we've been doing that for a long time you know, especially with, with wild industrial fisheries back in the 1980s when they switched from cotton to nylon nets and they got the refrigeration boats out there and they started fishing with military precision using all this new technology um, and just devastating the oceans and, 
and people's lives as well. Mm-hmm. I think with aquaculture, it was the same. You know, it was it was kind of the wild west, as you said. And and there's been terrible crimes against the ocean perpetrated by aquaculture. But what I've noticed um, is that you can't paint everything with the same brush and and you can't condemn all wild fishermen because some of them are artisanal some of them are indigenous some of them are small scale fishermen who are very sustainable in the way that they do it and there's also large commercial ventures that are changing their ways and and managing their stocks um for for return to abundance and i I think when it comes to wild caught fish we need to remember that especially smaller fish can regenerate very quickly mm-hmm. when you're looking at sardines or or other you know anchovies or or mackerel these are fish that can bounce back in a number of years if you just you know reduce bycatch and and apply scientific quotas and plan for you know a, a, a return to to a certain um a certain a certain amount of, of fish in the wild it's entirely possible and mm-hmm. with aquaculture there's new technologies that are allowing aquaculture um, um, practitioners to to do things in a way that reduces the footprint enormously so the really gross thing about aquaculture is that there like 40 percent mortality is acceptable in that industry that's just that's yuck, awful. right? Yeah. That's really bad. Um, you don't want to, you know, be eating something that comes from an environment where forty percent of them just couldn't survive the conditions that they were living in. Like that's awful. Right. Yeah. Um, but there are certain aquaculture practitioners who have a two percent mortality, which is basically mm-hmm. what you have in the wild. Mm-hmm. Um, there's feed companies that are looking at. Um, com- completely removing all of the unsustainable ingredients that they had um, and looking at at, at um, how they can move from soy to the guar gum plant that lives mm-hmm. in the desert, requires hardly any fresh water, and they mm-hmm. take the waste of that plant, which has the same protein content as soy. So mm-hmm. there's, there's innovative solutions to try to reduce the footprint um, increase, you know, the seaweed that they're eating in the feed and all these other things. But I think the point is that um, there are ways to do things differently mm-hmm. and technology is going to be a big part of the solution. And we're seeing a lot of innovation in that space. And with fisheries, whether it's aquaculture or wild caught, I think the consumer has a huge role to play, you yeah. know, and, and creating transparent supply chains embedding storytelling in that experience of of buying fish, Mm -hmm. verifying where it comes from. Um, All of these things are going to create a situation where we freeze out the pirates, we freeze out those who are, who are, you know, criminally engaging in, in, in these activities and really reward the ones um, who are obeying the law and doing things in a sustainable way. And, and, you know, personally, I haven't eaten fish in about 20 years wow. because I didn't, I didn't want to eat fish that came from a pirate boat. You know, yeah. where human rights were being violated and right. and um, bycatch was out of control and and all of that. Um, it deeply upsets me what what is happening in our our seafood supply chain. But I've in, enjoyed enormously seeing those pioneers that are changing the way it's being done. Yeah. Um, to solve those problems. And it's not easy. You know, change is never easy. We have to address subsidies. We have to address all of these different things. But there are people who are working hard on it. And I think that's that's uh, extremely hopeful. Yeah, it is. It's funny. I, I don't eat fish myself either. And it, but it's it's mainly because I whenever I try to cook it, I mess it up. And I... <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> but, um, but what I do think a lot about is like, what kind of fish am I eating? And And I often think... That we're, you know, if we, you know, a lot of people think of fish as a fish, right? But, you know, one of the, one, there's a lot of uh, focus on, on tuna fisheries uh, that, that we that we do. And, and I often think about the efforts to farm tuna as the equivalent of almost farming tigers, because they're mm-hmm. like the top predator of the ocean. And it, to me, it sounds, you know, while I, while tuna is 
delicious. I'm sorry. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful fish and people around the world love it. It really is kind of the wrong fish to eat and certainly the wrong fish to domesticate. Um, yes. We haven't had great luck domesticating predators uh, for, mm -hmm. for industrial scale agriculture. So I often think maybe, maybe what we need to be thinking about is, and you referenced it with the smaller fish, is eating, if you're going to eat fish, eat, eat lower on the food chain. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? And eat local. Eat local. Eat mm -hmm. your, you know, get to know your fishmonger. Eat mm -hmm. locally caught fish. Support, you know, the fishermen in your community that are doing it right. Um, I, I think reconnecting with that, you know, supply chain is is really important. Um, and and you know, there's another reason for that as well, which is important to people, which is seafood fraud. You know, mm -hmm. it's right. Right. it's hard to know yeah. sometimes if you just buy a fillet mm -hmm. if it's really red snapper or if it's tilapia. Fish. Yeah, it's fish. <laughs> Um, so uh, there's a lot that needs to be done, but I think, you know, and, and obviously transitioning to a more plant-based diet is part of the solution. Mm -hmm. It's something that we've chosen to do, but I know it's not right for everybody. Um, and so if you really love fish and, and you really want to eat fish, there's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure that you're buying it from people who are ensuring that it doesn't come from you know, the bad actors and, and it's not harming the ocean. And there's a lot of opportunities to find both aquacultured and wild caught fish that are part of the solution. Right. And, and, and as you said earlier, what we are seeing is really some really great work by major retailers and even big fishing companies mm -hmm. to really yeah. um, uh, get better about practices on the water and tracing the supply chain so that as a consumer, you know what it is you're buying and have confidence in that. So yeah. it's really a great point. I'd love to just transition to the sort of just our changing world and the way the climate and the shifts in the ocean environment are affecting life. Um, and as we push for a restoration of the oceans and regeneration, we also have to keep in mind that these oceans are changing, right? And we're seeing things show up in places they weren't ever before. A good example is in Southern California, we see uh, the Humboldt squid, which is starting to show up. Um, you know, it's nothing like a hundred pound predatory squid to kind of uh, wake you up to the reality of our changing oceans. But I would love to just hear, you know, any sort of observations from your adventures and explorations around the world. Like, how is how are you seeing the ocean change? What what kind of things are are striking you? Well, one of the most striking places that I've seen change is in the coral reefs and the and the mm -hmm. massive bleaching events that we've had over the course of the past five years. Um, there was that big one in Australia in the Great Barrier Reef where scientists were monitoring the, the bleaching event and just their masks were filling with tears as they yeah. you know, dove through these once pristine, abundant environments and it was just a graveyard. Um, and, and that's been all over the place. And, and that's particularly heartbreaking to me because corals were my playground as a child yeah. and you know, I could spend hours just sitting in front of a coral head watching all the little inhabitants, you know, go about their business and, 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 um, and obviously they're, they're extremely important for ocean, ocean health and, and um, as nurseries of the sea, they're one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on earth, even more than rainforests. So I think that's been one of the biggest tragedies and and with climate change and and then of course you know everybody knows and is concerned about the plastic pollution mm -hmm. um and you know when we talk about being able to restore and rebuild our oceans the the big caveat to doing this is climate change and addressing climate change and keeping you know our, our paris agreement and keeping the warming under 1.5 degrees if, if that's even still possible um, because otherwise it's sort of everything else is, is kind of off the table if we can't do that. Um, but we can't restore an ocean if it's a landfill. So, you know, I, I think that there's, there's a lot to, to think about in this process of rebuilding our oceans and what we focus on and um, from how we articulate our ambition and create our roadmaps and the vision of what we want to accomplish together that, that needs to be a collaborative process um, but understanding that, that climate change is a very real threat. It's happening now. We're seeing species 
you know, that are migrating north. Um, almost the entire lobster population of North America is now in Maine, where they used to go all the way down to New York and New Jersey. Mm -hmm. There aren't really any there anymore because of the changing temperature of the waters. And they're not going to stay in Maine. You know, Maine lobstermen mm -hmm. know that in the next 20 years, they're going to be in Canada. Yeah. And they're going to have to find a new, a new line of work. And a lot of them are becoming kelp farmers, actually. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but, but we're seeing those changes now. Migration of species, um, the death of our coral reefs, um, you know, other, uh, and, and when certain species migrate, then other species get really hungry. Um, so we're seeing marine mammals suffering from this. Um, and, and the currents are changing, which brings food to certain communities, um, you know, like places like Peru are really sensitive to the El Nino and La Nina currents. Mm -hmm. And when La Nina hits, you often have like a, a huge death event of sea lions and other life there because the currents aren't bringing the food the way they usually do. And so as our currents change with climate change, we're gonna see more of that instability, which is gonna have huge impact on different ecosystems that rely on temperature, on currents, on weather, on different migrating patterns of different species. And as that all gets jumbled up, um, we'll, we'll continue to see the effects in the ocean. Um, related to this, one of the things I'm, uh, I think a lot about is that as the, as the oceans change, uh, temperatures, et cetera, and we're thinking about restoration and regeneration, um, we may not be able to put things back where they actually were. We may actually have to put things back in places they never were, mm -hmm. uh, which is a scary thought in for conservationists who are really been focused since the founding of the field on protecting things where they are, right? Well, what if where they are or were just can't support them anymore? And we've got to actually restore things to, like I said, to places they never were. That's kind of a scary idea uh, also kind of an energizing idea, if you will, just because, mm -hmm. we've, you know, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it's kind of a blank canvas in a lot of ways. What do you think of that? Is that yeah. just a danger zone or is it, uh, how do we think about that problem? Well, I feel like the, the, the approach has always been conservation, mm -hmm. preservation. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And in some places, conservation may still be the best solution for whatever place that is. Right. In some places, preservation, like just leaving it alone, not touching it, might be the best solution. And, and with that, I'm thinking about 30 by 30, you know, mm -hmm. putting aside 30% of our oceans by 2030, um, just letting it be, not fishing in it, not just letting it be um, a really important part of rebuilding our oceans and, and rebuilding our world is, is to be able to preserve. I think now is the time to also have in our toolkit um, what may be the most important aspect of our response to our current situation, which is restoration mm -hmm. and looking at everything that we've lost and deploying new fields of expertise. So beyond just marine biologists, including technologists and engineers and you know all sorts of different talents to be able to imagine how we deploy these new technologies these new ideas um, and also looking at the places that we've lost that have changed and that we need to rebuild mm -hmm. and we may be building kelp forests in places where we didn't before so mm -hmm. we're expecting for example that um, you know kelp forests are probably going to migrate on their own to the Arctic Ocean, which is, has perfect conditions for kelp as the climate changes. That's gonna be also a wonderful opportunity for the indigenous people mm -hmm. um, and communities in the Arctic Ocean to practice kelp farming as an, an economic opportunity that maintains their traditions and their culture intact. Um, so we're going to see these changes anyway. Yeah. So to say that we don't want to rebuild something because it's not the way it used to be is denying the basic fact that nothing is going to be the way it was. You know, when, when we talk about rebuilding abundance by 2050 to the same kind of abundance of life that my grandfather knew, it doesn't mean it's going to be exactly the same. It may be different. 
Right. But that doesn't mean that we can't rebuild abundance and we can't rebuild vibrant, flourishing, thriving ecosystems. It just may not be exactly the way it used to. But if we don't, then we will be left with dead zones. And I don't think that that's the alternative that we're looking for. Yeah, that's very well said. And one of the one of the I'd love to sort of you mentioned technology, and one of the technologies that I think is um, holds a lot of interesting promise as well as I suppose danger in this regard is um, is you know CRISPR technology and biotechnology that. On the one hand, you know there are, there is a lot of active work out there um, among coral biologists to actually assist the evolution of corals, so that they can persist where they are. So identifying corals that can survive high, more warmer temperatures and more acidic temperatures, and propagating them, or you know helping them, you know harvest you know harvest the uh, the, the the zygotes, grow them up, and put them back out there. Um, what do you think of that technology and what are the sort of opportunities and pitfalls of that? And we'll have to just sort of pivot into a broader discussion about technologies you see out there. Well, I think that there's a lot of exciting technology um, like blockchain and AI and, and you know, the ability to, for, for a fisherman to take out his smartphone and video his nets emptying onto his boat and having AI be able to tell him exactly how many of every species he caught and uploading that to a government database so that they can do, you know, an a, um, a audit of the fisheries happening in, in, in their EEZ. That's amazing, right? That can be transformative in a lot of ways. Um, the, the, there's a lot of coral reef technology that I'm really excited about. Um, and I, I don't think that editing genes in, in the laboratory is on my list. Um, <laughs> I, I don't necessarily support GMO corals, um, but, but I think that, you know, we can assist nature with evolution. And so um, being able to identify what the most resilient corals are, deploying sensors on a reef that can monitor effects mm -hmm. in real time of very localized salinity or acidity or oxygen, um, so that we can determine which corals are thriving in which conditions and then harvesting those corals to, to propagate them and then release them back into the wild um, is, I think, a very ethical way to ensure that we don't have massive losses. Um, there's also a lot of work being done in, with the acceleration of that with, through um, 3D printing of calcium carbonate skeletons that are biologically accurate versions of what you would find with, with different coral species. And then planting microfragments of corals onto that 3D printed skeleton because the microfragments now we know they, they grow quickly and can cover that skeleton in a matter of weeks. Amazing. Um, so then you have, you know, size wise, you have a you know, 20 year old coral instead of a one year old coral. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can accelerate the restoration of reefs with corals that are more resilient, uh, more resistant to disease or, or climate. And you have the, the, the coral structures that the other marine life needs to be able to survive. Um, and that's really exciting to me because it's yeah, it's it's using technology in the best possible way and being very practical and, and realistic about just this moment in time and what we need to do to um to to protect life on this planet. And I think we've been very involved in being a destructive force in the mm -hmm. oceans. And I think it that may require that we become very involved in being a constructive force for the oceans. Um and and you know, the thing about that is that we have built our system with a scarcity mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we say it's the environment or the economy, and mm -hmm. it's okay to prioritize the economy over the environment. But then when the environment is gone, you don't have much of an economy left. Right. You know, imagine if the, if the pilgrims had come to the United States and they had been met with a desert. 
not the sparkling rivers and lakes filled with fish and the forests filled with game and the prairies that were perfect for agriculture and all of these extraordinary natural resources that built the wealth of the nation. But there was just a desert. There would not have been the same wealth of a nation. And, and I think we, we, are, we, we give ourselves this false dilemma when we, when we prioritize the economy over the environment. And so if we switch to an abundance mindset and say, we will, we will reap from abundance rather than reap from scarcity. And how do we rebuild that abundance so that there's enough for everybody and there's enough for nature, then we will be in a place that can be, um, yeah, a, a place that we can sustain. We can't sustain where we are now. We're sustaining, mm -hmm. you know, nothing, right? 6% right. of historic with different fishery. I mean, we're, we're sustaining nothing. We need to sustain abundance. And so to get there, we need to rebuild abundance. <laughs> yep. It's interesting. One of the, you, you, you talked earlier about 50% of the oceans being kind of altered or, or lost. And there's a recent study that suggests that 80% of the terrestrial biomes have been converted from their natural state to some human use. And I often uh, uh, think about, you know, uh, the Nature Conservancy and the Environmental Movement Conservation Movement really has focused on setting up protected areas. And in the ocean, we call marine protected areas. Um, and there's some spectacular ones out there. But if we are able to transition to an abundance mindset in the way we manage the unprotected oceans, um, how do we start to think about protected areas? Maybe they're not the be all end all. Maybe, maybe if we have sustainable sort of regenerative use of a lot of the oceans, we can still get the effects of, of conservation. You know, I think there's a lot of important science that we're going to have to do and, and fundamentally different science. Mm. You know, the science, a lot of the science that has been done, and, and it's important that we know these things, but it, it's been focused on what we're losing mm. and what we're killing and what's dead, right? And how fast we're killing everything. And it's important to know all of that. But I think it's also important to know what are the solutions? What's working? How quickly... If we did this, could we achieve that? Um, and when I was a little girl uh, learning to ski in the French Alps, I had a ski instructor that took me up to the bunny slope, to the top of the bunny slope, and he crossed my skis and he said, Alexandra, if you want to get to the bottom of the slope safely, then you need to keep your, your destination always at, you know, in, in your line of sight, you need to focus on your destination. If you start looking at the trees, then you will end up skiing into them and most likely get injured. Okay, so I kept my eye on, on where I wanted to go. And I think that, you know, whether it's politics or science or, um, you know, e even in the, in the nonprofit community, we, we're so focused on the trees and we're focused yeah on the problems and we're focused and on, on debating these problems and, and whether they're happening at all or how far away they might be or you know how imminent they might be, rather than focusing on building consensus around where we wanna go and how we're going to get there. And, um, and I think we need radical collaboration, not just within the nonprofit community because there's not enough of that, um, but we also need it you know, with with companies, with scientists, with institutions, with government. There needs to be radical collaboration around shaping this vision of an abundant future and, and how we, we get there. And um, I think there's a lot of market relevant solutions. There's great opportunity for investors. Um, part of uh, Professor Duarte's study um, in nature that was all about rebuilding marine biodiversity and what we would have to do to get to a more abundant ocean by 2050 um, revealed that, you know, for every dollar invested in ocean restoration, there's about a $10 return. So, you know, we know that oceans are the least funded of the SDGs. And that's amazing because they are our life support system. Mm -hmm. um, but philanthropy alone will not fill that gap. And so I think the other thing that's really interesting is looking at all of the different financial opportunities. Um, and I know TNC does a lot of this with blue mm -hmm. bonds and, and other mm -hmm. things. We need to look at those financial instruments as part of the solution, um, knowing that philanthropy just isn't enough. Yeah, well, well said. 
so we talked, you talked about plastics earlier. Um, and, you know, it's pretty, I said at the opening, I wasn't going to linger on bad stuff. But when you look into the plastics problem in the ocean, it is truly terrifying. The um, the amount of microfibers out there. And, you know, um, I don't I don't buy anything but natural fibers anymore because I, I don't be washing mm -hmm. that stuff into the ocean. Um, but um, uh, and so there's a lot of focus on microfibers and how they're entering the food chain. And we're literally eating the sort of stuff that comes off our fleece. And when we eat a fish, if you eat a fish. Um, uh, but then you just have this, you still in some parts of the world have this constant flow of, of garbage uh, into the oceans. And there's a number of um, interesting, there's a lot of interesting work going on on plastics. What, what, do, you, what do you think uh, is, is the most sort of exciting um, sort of solution out there to the plastics crisis? Well, with plastics, I think the thing that concerns me the most is the narrative that's being pushed by beverage companies and plastic companies and, and, and oil and gas companies that recycling is the solution hmm. because it really takes the burden off of them and puts it onto us. Hmm. And that's not fair because we don't have any alternatives. We don't have that many options. Mm -hmm. Um, aside obviously from you know not using plastic bags and not using straws but so much of the other stuff that we buy in our daily life is is plastic and you know it's kind of a privilege to be able to buy in bulk from organic grocery stores and really cut all plastic out of your life and um you know i make that effort and i do the best i can and it's harder in a pandemic and you know it just underscores to me that it's it's not it's not us. Like yeah. we need companies that are able to create alternatives to plastic and provide us with those solutions. And I, and so for me, it's it's really not not recycling. That's not yeah. the final solution. Um, and and for me, companies that say, oh, you know, we've got this great recycling, and here's how you do it. I, I feel like it's a cop out. It's not a solution, and they they need to invest in doing a lot better. And, and switching out their products for something that's not. Um, when you buy something that's made out of recycled plastic, the ocean doesn't care. When it hits the ocean, it's the same plastic bottle, whether it's been recycled or not. Um, so I like ideas about how do we create plastic-free zones? How do we replace plastic mm -hmm. with other things? Um, you know, the French recently passed an interesting piece of legislation that was just like, no, no more. Like just, you can't. And so you're seeing a lot of big- On production, you mean? They put a ban on production or what? They are banning, yeah, they're banning it. And and so now in the big um, big grocery stores, big supermarkets, like the, the type of like Walmart, like super huge ones, you can't find plastic straws, you can't find plastic um, forks and knives and plates and cups, mm. it's all paper. Um, and, and that kind of legislation is really important. You know, it, it, it's going to take a lot of different people implementing different ideas and different solutions to solve such a complex problem. But I think that, um, we, we need to move past recycling to replacing plastic and really only using it for the things that it's necessary for and, and for medical use or, you know, other things where we can't replace it. You know, and and it doesn't end up in the ocean, and so you know that can stay. But um, you know, beverage and cosmetics and all that can we can use other things. It's yeah. just going to take effort. And you know, now we've seen what people can do with the pandemic. Like it's, right. it, it, don't tell me it's going to take you twenty <laughs> years to phase out plastic from your shampoo line. Like I just won't <laughs> buy it, right? And and. Um, and telling me that it's my job to recycle your plastic bottles doesn't cut it either. Um, yeah. and, and I think that, 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 um, that more and more people are understanding that. I, 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 I started to, to talk a lot about um, the words that we use to describe our ambitions. And, and for me, there's a word that really came out of the 1950s Mad Men era, which is this consumer concept, right? That, that we are consumers and companies market to us so that we will buy as much of their product as possible um, and fill our houses with stuff while they get extremely rich, right? And, and, and that 
that is straight out of the 1950s handbook of how to build your company and how to market things to people. And, and, and that word consumer is, I think, part of our big problem. And, and so um, I like the word contributor. Ooh. And, and you know, seeing ourselves as contributors, but also having companies see us as contributors is, is a game changer. You know, I'm a contributor to a different future or I'm a contributor to the status quo. And every choice I make throughout my day is going to lead us, you know, to one future or the other. And it's, it's that like stark, it's that clear. And so um, when we talk about being contributors rather than consumers, we're putting ourselves in a whole different category of, of aspiration and of action. And, um, and I, I think that's important. In fact, I, I talked about that at the Consumer Goods Forum. Hmm. Um, I, I gave a, a keynote there and uh, they included that idea in their report. So it's, it's, it's something that I think um, as we think about the future we want to build together, how we think about ourselves is just as important. I love it. And I, and I think from the polling we've done, at least in places like California, the consumers are there on plastics. The contributors are there on plastics. They want to be yep. part of the phase out. Well, I think we're, we're entering the phase of wrapping up. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about your grandfather, who um, obviously had a big impact on you, but also had a big impact on me. In many ways, I'm in this, I'm on this screen because of what your grandfather did. Um, because I, as a little boy, I was watching those, you know, his, his, his movies and his books and, um, and, and just sort of opened my eyes to the, the amazing world of the ocean. I would love for you just to close and sort of like share with our viewers, like what, what are some of the things he left you with that sort of shaped your worldview? Um, I mean, there's so much, obviously, um, yeah. he and my father are the reason that I am who I am and do what I do. And, um, I went on my first expedition when I was four months old with, um, my father and, and I was on expedition, um, until his death. And, um, then my grandfather taught me to dive when I was seven years old in the South of France. And, and I would spend time with him in Paris. He would take me um, to get a hot chocolate at Angelina's or, um, you know, take me dress shopping or um, out for an ice cream. And, and I, I remember being struck by what fame was and n growing up with him and knowing the depth of his commitment to this and how deeply he felt these issues, these things that he had seen in the ocean, this, these trends that he had lived. And, and I, I remember we were walking down the street together and um, he was whistling because he liked to whistle when we walked down the street. And um, I was always kind of embarrassed about it. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, these young men stopped him. They, 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 they tried to call out to him, but he was whistling and he was 80 and he didn't hear them. <laughs> and as we walked by, they got offended because they thought he'd ignored them. Huh. And they started yelling insults at him <laughs> as we continued down the street. And I kind of looked back at them over my shoulder and I, I didn't understand. I, I was like nine or 10 and I, I didn't understand this, such a rapid switch from admiration to hatefulness yeah and i i realized that um you know there it's you are and i think my grandfather there was there was definitely this this sense that i had that he he was not seen for everything that he really was about mm -hmm. um and i think that was was hurtful to him um and so I've, I've always kind of taken from that, like the, the meaningfulness of the work that, that my family has done, impossibility of walking away from it, mm -hmm. you know, just this has always been my life from the time I was little and it always will be. And there's just never anything. People will be like, what would you have done if you didn't do ocean? I'm like, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> it's just not ever been something I thought about um, because I, it's hard. <laughs> 
it's hard. Um, it's really hard work when when things that you've worked so hard for are overturned yeah. or rolled back. You know how that feels. Yep. Um, it's hard work, but it's it's purposeful and it's my purpose and it's not not ever going to do anything else. And and I think he showed me that, but he also showed me how fickle it can be to be in the public eye and mm. um, and how that doesn't really advance. Like past a certain point, fame doesn't help. Yeah. And 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 uh, and so I've I've always been very private and 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 very much been in the public square on oceans about oceans but i was i've always been very very um very quiet about you know my family my kids where i live you know what i do because i i guard that privacy because i've seen how how ugly it can be yeah. um even before social media oh, yeah. <laughs> now it's just out of control yeah, yeah. So he, he but he taught me so many things and i think his his um and my father as well well, thank you so much for um, for your time, for sharing with us, for sharing yourself with us, and your 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 perspectives on the ocean. It's meant so much to me to be able to spend this time with you, and uh, I just thank you so much. can go by in a blink of an eye, but it can also represent a period of life-changing opportunity. I know this because my son recently had his 10th birthday. Now the unfortunate thing is in his lifetime, one out of every two species that depends on freshwater in California could go extinct. So for this, we need some radical change. We appreciate you joining us today. And remember, Today is a great day to reflect on your favorite body of water, whether that be a river, a lake, a wetland, or a spring, because water is life. Hey, it's Laura Dern here, and I just wanted to say happy Earth Day Summit. Thank you to the Nature Conservancy and everyone there for your brilliant minds and ideas to take care of our mother. With all that we know is ahead of us to help heal her, we also know that we have the answers and what we need in our soil. And we can do this with your guidance and your genius. So thank you for all you do.